Father, we pray that you would open up our eyes this morning and help us to see the risen Lord Jesus and open our hearts to respond to him rightly. In his name, amen. And they all lived happily ever after. We know those words really well. How many times have we heard them at the end of a story? The princess is locked in a tower, guarded by a dragon. The knight comes to rescue rescue her. She's freed. They get married. And they all live happily ever after. The details may be different, but that's the basic shape to pretty much every story you can think of. Something bad happens. Something good happens. They all live happily ever after. And the reason that this is such a popular popular shape to a story is because it's ultimately the shape of the Bible, the shape of the whole story of humanity. People are locked up, bound to sin. The night Jesus comes along and frees them, they get married and all live happily ever after. And the question before us this morning is, does the fact that if we're God's people, we know that we have that happy ending, Is that just something to look forward to in the future? Or does it make any difference to us now while we're still being enslaved by the dragon? Why should we hold on to our happily ever after? Well, that's the question that Paul tackles in this section of 1 Corinthians 15. The whole chapter is about the resurrection and he's going to tackle different issues around it. And in this passage, he's concerned with Why should I believe in the resurrection of the dead? What difference does it make to me? He sets that question up in verse 12. Look at it. Now, if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? There are some in Corinth who have heard that Jesus has been raised from the dead, but they still believe there's no such thing as resurrection from the dead. Paul asks, how? How can you believe that? And he looks at that question from two different angles, two sides of a coin. In verses 13 to 19, he pretends that what they're teaching is true, that there is no resurrection from the dead. And he lays out the consequences of that belief. In 20 to 28, he then starts from the belief that the resurrection of the dead is true. And he lays out the benefits of believing that. So firstly, let's look at the negative, the consequences of not believing in the resurrection of the dead. And hear what Paul does to say to his readers, okay, if you don't want to believe in the resurrection of the dead, then there are these other things that you can't believe either. The first and the most important of these consequences comes in verse 13. But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. If you want to believe that people do not rise from the dead, then you have to believe that not even Christ has risen from the dead. If there's no such thing as resurrection, then there's no such thing as the resurrection, capital R, the one we celebrate at Easter. And you might think, okay then, I I won't believe that Christ actually rose from the dead. But note what Paul says at the beginning of verse 14. And if Christ has not been raised. His logic looks like this. If the dead are not raised, then not even Christ has been raised. And if not even Christ has been raised, then all these other things follow. So the first block in our chain is that no resurrection means no resurrection of Christ. And all of the other steps in the chain follow from that and the next consequence that follows it from no resurrection of Christ is there in verse 14 then our preaching is in vain Paul had summarized his preaching for them at, back at the start of chapter 15 for I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. The core message of the preaching of the gospel is the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. If Jesus was not actually raised again, then all of that preaching 
is utterly pointless. It's just empty words. In verses 1 to 2, Paul was confident that his preaching was saving them. Not so if Christ was not raised. His preaching was powerless, empty. If Christ was not raised, then what I'm saying to you right now is just powerless and empty, and you shouldn't listen to it. It's not going to do anything. The next consequence follows from that in verse 15. We are even found to be misrepresenting God. The point here is simple to see. The testimony at the heart of the gospel is that God raised Christ from the dead. And that is a lie. If God does not raise anyone from the dead, it's a blasphemy. It's bearing false witness about God to say that God does something that he does not do. When Martin or I stand up here or when anyone else speaks to you and tells you that Christ was raised from the dead, if that is not true, then we are guilty of a serious blasphemy. That should tell you how much weight we put on that claim when we make it. And Paul reminds us of the foundation of what he's saying in verse 16. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. That's the core logic behind everything that he's saying here. The next consequence from that in verse 17. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. Faith is not just some warm, fuzzy feeling that we have inside that we can't really put words on. Faith has to have an object. I can't just have faith. I have to have faith in someone or something. And if you're a Christian, then your faith is in Christ. But if there is no resurrection, then putting your faith in Christ is pointless. He's dead. He can't help you. Can you see how this belief that there's no resurrection of the dead makes not only the preaching of the gospel empty and pointless, it makes the gospel itself empty. It doesn't do anything for us. And what's the result of that? And you are still in your sins. The core message of the gospel is that Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners. That was his mission. That's why he came. And that mission was a failure if today he is still lying dead in a tomb somewhere outside Jerusalem. A dead savior is no use to anyone. If that's the case, then the gospel is not good news at all. It's a tragedy. If Christ has not been raised, then we have built our hopes on something that is empty and meaningless. We've tried to build a house on thin air. And the consequences don't just stay with us in this life. The denial has consequences in the next life too, in verse 18. Then those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. This is the sum of what Paul has already said. If Christ has not been raised, then the gospel is powerless. Our faith is futile. We're still in our sins. Then anyone who believed in Christ while alive has died. They're dead. They've perished. Their hope of life after death has come to nothing. If Christ has not been raised, there is no hope for us after death. And the final consequence in verse 19 really brings it home. If in Christ we have hope in this life only, then we are most to be pitied. If we have no hope for life after death, if because there is no life after death, then we're deluding ourselves and our situation is miserable. We might as well call it quits now, forget about it and, call it, uh, and put an end to it, for what's the point? That misery all stems from that belief that we started with, that there is no resurrection of the dead. If we're ultimately putting our hopes in a dead Christ to save us, then the situation for us is miserable. And everything that we've built on the resurrection 
every hope that we put in Christ falls flat. If the dead are not raised, then not even Christ has been raised. And if not even Christ has been raised, our situation is miserable. But Paul doesn't want us to have that misery. He wants us to believe that Christ has in fact been raised. He's given us the negative consequences. But now we turn to our second section where he's going to tell us the positive benefits of believing that Christ has been raised. Verse 20. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. And it's in the second part of that verse that our first positive benefit comes. Christ is described as the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. But we need to unpack that a bit. Firstly, what's this about first fruits? Well, if you were to come into my garden or look on my kitchen windowsill, you would see lots of plants at different stages of growing. And I think some of the furnace along are a pot of raspberry canes that I've got. And if you look carefully at the end, you'll see some small buds that are going to open up into flowers, which are then going to bring out fruits, raspberries hopefully. Then when those raspberries are ripe in a few months' time, I'll come along and harvest them, and they'll be my first fruits from that plant. But the thing is, I'm not just going to take a couple of berries from that plant and then throw the rest in the bin. I'm going to keep coming back because there's going to be more and more fruits to come. Those are the first fruits, but they're not the only fruits. And so that's what we mean by first fruits. But Paul is talking about first fruits, which has a more specific meaning. In the Old Testament, the law said that anyone who grew their own food, farmers, had to bring their first fruits, the very first things that they harvested, to the temple to be offered to God in worship as thanks for the great harvest that was going to follow. You've been waiting months and months for your crops to grow, and as soon as something is ripe enough to harvest, you don't take it and eat it for yourself you take it and give thanks to God for the harvest. And Paul is using the same kind of language about Jesus here. Jesus is the first fruits, the very beginning. But we give thanks to God that he's not the first, he's, that he's the first, he's not the only. Jesus rising up out of the earth, being dug up like the first potatoes, promises us that more are definitely going to follow. In verse 20, he's the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. We've had Christ's resurrection, but that's going to be followed by more resurrections. And to show how these resurrections are going to follow Christ, Paul sets up a comparison, a sort of table, with Adam on one side and Jesus on the other. On Adam's side, we've got death. On Jesus' side, there's resurrection. And the point in verses 21 and 22 is that as human beings in Adam's line, we experience death because we're on Adam's team. It says, as by a man came death. When Adam and Eve sinned in the garden, that brought death into the world, but not just for them, for every single human being who has ever lived. Even Jesus, as fully man, experienced death because of his relationship to Adam. On Jesus' side, we have life. By a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. The comparison is made clear in verse 22. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. Maybe you're sitting there thinking, well, what if I don't want to be on either team? What if I want to just sit in the stands spectating? The passage, the Bible doesn't give you that option. If you're a human being, you're on Adam's team. He represents you and his inheritance to you is death. Since Adam sinned, every single human being who has ever lived has died. No amount of human effort, no amount of science is going to change that. What has changed that, though, is the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. 
Jesus has gone through the grave to glorious life on the other side. And in doing so, he broke the link with Adam and death. And the glorious truth this morning is that if you put yourself in Christ, if you make him your representative, then he may be the first fruits, but you can be part of the following fruits. You might remember a few weeks ago that we saw the shape of Christ's life and the Christian's life is a tick. Christ has gone ahead on that tick, but he invites you to follow him. Where he has gone, he wants you to be. The order is clear in verse 24. Each in his own order, Christ the first fruits, then at his coming, those who belong to Christ. And so we're living in the gap between two resurrections. Christ has already been raised, that is definite. And it's the sure sign that the second one is going to come. The first fruits have already appeared and been harvested. We know that the greater harvest is on its way. What happens after that though? When the trumpets have sounded and those who are in Christ rise from their graves, what then? We're told in verse 24, then comes the end. But how does the story finish? Is it a happily ever after? Well, we're told that the end is when he delivers the kingdom to God the Father after destroying every rule and every authority and every power. Now, there's a lot to unpack in there, so let's take the second bit of that first. We're told that this is going to happen after Jesus has destroyed every rule, authority, and power. The image here is of Jesus as a military king. He establishes his rule by conquering all other rules and authorities that stand in his way. There can be no treaties, no agreeing to coexist. Jesus must be the absolute unquestioned sovereign of the universe. If there's to be eternal peace in Christ's kingdom, if we're to avoid another situation where sin arises up and ruins everything, then all other sources of authority must be destroyed. Only then will the reign of Christ be eternally secure. This is made stronger in verse 25. For he must reign until he has put all enemies under his feet. The very reason that Christ is on the throne right now is that is so that his enemies will be subdued, conquered, and Christ's kingdom is established and unquestioned. Governments, empires, rulers, dictators, political institutions, cultural institutions, enemies of the gospel, all must fall and be subjected to Christ in his ever-expanding kingdom. From victory unto victory, his army he shall lead till every foe is vanquished and Christ is Lord indeed. It's not just human earthly powers that need to be defeated though. The cosmic powers that oppose Christ also must be defeated. Christ has come, died and risen to defeat the power of sin, to free his people from its grasp. And look at verse 26. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. Sin brought death into the world. The two go hand in hand. To defeat one is to defeat the other. We saw that back in the first section. You're still in your sins, and therefore the dead have perished. There's no life after death. Sin and death go together. So long as death is still a thing, Christ cannot reign eternally. We could not live as subjects in Christ's eternal kingdom for we would just die again someday. Death itself needs to be done away with. And that brings us back to where we began in this passage, the resurrection of the dead. As soon as Christ rose, he signed death's death warrant. Death was no longer the ultimate, final, unconquerable force that it had been from the time of Adam. Finally, death's grip was loosened. And at the point on the last day when Christians will be raised from the dead, death will be defeated. 
One of my favourite poems to reread at this time of year is John Donne's Death Be Not Proud. The poem begins, Death, be not proud, though some have called thee mighty and dreadful, for thou art not so. For those whom thou thinkst thou dost overthrow die not per death, nor yet canst thou kill me. And it ends, One short sleep past, we wake eternally, and death shall be no more. Death, thou shalt die. John Donne was a church minister, and he was only able to have that sort of confidence in the face of death because he was a Christian. He was clearly thinking of passages like 1 Corinthians 15 when he wrote that poem. Christians can look forward to the day when the dead are raised, death is defeated, and Christ reigns supreme. For the next week, we're in a period of national mourning following the death of the Duke of Edinburgh. If we are Christians, we approach death and mourning very differently, with the hope, the confidence that death will be defeated at the resurrection to eternal life. But we mustn't see this as Christ embarking on a solo mission, going off on his horse to win the battle by himself. Rather, in verse 27, the victory clearly belongs to the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And this raises something else we must be aware of, which is the idea when it says all things will be in subjection to Christ. Somehow that means the Father will be in subjection to Christ. Paul's logic is that it's the Father who is putting things in subjection to Christ. Christ lifts his foot up and the Father puts everything underneath it. Therefore the Father cannot be under Christ's feet. So Christ will reign over all things except his Father. That they are Father and Son is no accident. You know, those aren't just convenient names that have been put on them. They are Father and Son. And it's clear not only from the Bible, but from the world around us, the children do not rule over their parents. Children are to submit to their parents not parents to their children. So the father will not submit to the son. But again, does that leave us with two equal sources of authority? The father on one side and the son on the other. How would that fit with what we saw earlier about the king's rule needing to be total and unchallenged? If the kingdom is to be eternally secure, there can only be one number one. But then how can that be the son if the father can't submit to him? And that means we need to circle back to verse 24. At the end, when Christ has destroyed every rule and power, what does he then do? He delivers the kingdom to the father. Christ establishes his kingdom, his throne, defeats any enemy who could possibly challenge it, and then hands it over to the Father. He signs the title deeds over, giving up any claim he could possibly have on it. It's no longer his, it's his gift to his Father to reign over for eternity. But that might still, might still just leave us with the same problem we saw earlier of two potential kings. A bit like when Pope Benedict stepped down and then handed over to Pope Francis, but Benedict is still around and some people would rather they still had him. For the Father's reign to be eternal, there can be no question, no challenge to it. And so we read in verse 28, when all things are subjected to him, the Father, then the Son himself will also be subjected to him who put all things in subjection under him, that God may be all in all. At the moment where Jesus has handed the throne, the crown, the kingdom over to his father, then he himself will bow down before his father and submit to him as a perfect son. And Paul wants us to see that this, this is the great benefit of the resurrection of the dead. 
on the last day when Christ and his people bow down and submit to the Father, when every last enemy, including death itself, has been defeated, then we shall see the Father in full glory as finally the total undisputed sovereign of the universe that he created. If you're a Christian, if you're in Christ, to use the language of our passage, you could not be a part of this kingdom if it weren't for the resurrection of the dead. As we saw, if the dead are not raised, then death is the end, that's it. But since the dead are raised, since Christ has been raised, we can look forward to this glorious moment on the last day. If you're not a Christian, if you're not in Christ, then the sobering message of our passage is that that hope does not apply to you. You're still in Adam, you're still under the power of death, and you can't be a part of this glorious eternal kingdom. But the message of our passage, the message of the entire Bible, is that Jesus came, died, and rose again to save you from that power. He rose so that death wouldn't have to be the end for you. Don't remain under the misery that we saw in the first half of our passage. Don't let death have its sway over you. Put your faith in Christ and find the hope of the resurrection to eternal life. It's because of the work of God in raising Christ from the dead that all of these other things follow. It's because of that work that we can sing in just a moment. Priestly king, enthroned forever, high in heaven above, sin and death and hell shall never stifle hymns of love. Will you join me in making that our song this morning? Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your resurrection. We thank you for the hope that we can find in that. We pray that on the last day we would be found in you, that we would be raised to a glorious life as subjects in your eternal kingdom. We pray that if we are already in you, that that hope would drive us forward and comfort us this morning, or if we are not yet in you, that you would bring us into yourself. In your name we ask. Amen.